Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, we're here to talk about artificial intelligence research that we're doing between the Mile High Flood District and RESPEC. My name is John Valines. I'm the South Watershed Manager for the Flood District, and I'm here with Andy Cross, a hydrologist with RESPEC that has been working with us on this project. We thought it would be important to talk a little bit about what AI is not, at least not in the context of the work that we're doing here. AI is not some mystical genie that lives in your computer and you know orders your coffee for you. Although there's definitely a uh, there's applications of AI that do that do similar things. It's not Skynet. It's not some kind of you know diffuse cloud-based artificial intelligence that's watching everything we do and learning about our behavior and you know predicting our next move. Uh, although people probably have a vision for AI that looks somewhat like that as well, but what AI is in the context of this project and what we're doing right now is really much more limited in scope than that. And it's essentially mimicking human learning and cognition on a really pretty fundamental level. And it's think of it as a piece of software in this case that runs on an individual computer. You know, it's, it's limited to the input that we provide it. In this case, it's images. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, it's not something that's cloud-based. It's not something that's out there learning on its own in an unsupervised way, although there are models that, that do function more in that uh, vein, but ours is what we call a supervised learning model, where it just learns what we tell it to learn. So it's entirely based on human teaching and observation, and specifically the images in this case that we're providing to it. And AI, in the, in the context of this project, is a method of interpreting and triaging large amounts of data, large amounts of, in this case, photographs that are derived from drone imagery, but it could be other other sources of data as well. And it's really just a means of doing what we've always done in our jobs, which is looking at the stream and trying to interpret what it's doing based on what we see. It's just a faster, easier, more efficient means of doing that than we've had in the past. And when you combine it with drone technology, AI is kind of like your digital intern staff, except it has it's able to apply the knowledge and experience of lifelong practitioners in the field right away. And really, you can think of the way that we train an AI model like this as being very similar to the way that you would train a young engineer or an intern. You know, you show the model a picture or you show it something that's happening and you say, this is what we think is happening here. It it remembers that and tries to apply that interpretation to future images. It's really the same way that we treat that we teach each other in the field. It just happens a little bit quicker and a little bit more efficiently. And the drones especially give us extra eyes on the ground in a way that we haven't had before. We're able to essentially collect on-demand data from perspectives that we weren't able to have in the past. Um, it's just another, another means of, like I said, doing what we've always done, just from a different perspective, more frequently, more efficiently, and hopefully in a way that leads us to better results. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy and let him tell you a little bit more in detail about how AI works. So just to build off of what John said a little bit there, um, really when we're thinking about artificial intelligence in this scope, it's not really dissimilar to how, how people learn. Um, that whole idea of, you know, practice makes perfect is really analogous to how we train artificial intelligence systems where the more often, you know, a child is exposed to an alphabet, is exposed to math, is exposed to music, the better they get at learning it. And so it's through this kind of iterative, iterative exposure to the specific examples that we're talking about here that these models start to start to learn, start to get better at generalizing to unseen data. Um, I think one of the things that uh, people don't really know is that linear regression is in fact a form of artificial intelligence or machine learning because you have input data, you have you know, an output data, you have something that you're trying to measure and you can ask the computer to fit a line through that data and then you can use that to make predictions on, on future incoming data. So it's, it's not as um, unknown of a concept as it might sound. We, my, many of us use it all the time. Next slide. So what we're using in these in this specific project is called computer vision, and it's a subset of machine learning algorithms 
where we're asking the computer to interpret an image. Um, this one on the right here is an example of sediment fences. Uh, it's a project that we're working on with CDOT and it's really just meant to illustrate um, we can give a computer an image, we can train it on these images, and then we can ask it to predict on new images. It takes a sufficient amount of data, it takes um, you know, an amount of time to build these systems, but once they're working, it's really quick and efficient. Okay. So when we started talking with John, we wanted to try to nail down some of the parameters that we were gonna try to work with. The ones that we came up with were Manning Zen, erosion, percent cover of trees, herbs, and bushes, sedimentation, and channel obstructions. Throughout this project, um, we've had initial successes with Manning Zen, erosion, percent cover of herbs, bushes, and trees, and then we're continuing to work on sedimentation and channel obstructions, but those are less common, and so we're finding less examples in the data that we've collected to train models for, for those parameters. But Based on the success of erosion, we feel pretty confident that these are, are going to follow the same sort of tra trajectory. So that first picture in the top is a generalized example of the type of neural network that we're using. And so basically what it's saying is that you can take an input image, it breaks it down to really the base components of what make up that image. And that's color, it's texture, it's shape, and it's size. And through a bunch of linear algebra magic, we can ask the computer to learn shape, color, texture, size, and potentially even location for these different areas of image within areas of interest within our images. So you can go to the next one. So for Mannings, um, and, and I think and this was really kind of the genesis of, of a lot of these projects and a lot of these ideas. Um, many of us know what Manning's is already, but it's, you know, it's a surface roughness coefficient used in hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. Um, typically, it's assessed through a lot of manual and time intensive site visits where you're walking around, you're trying to figure out, you know, is this 0.035, is this 0.04? I know that these are bushes, but, you know, how dense exactly are they, how tall are they? And if you're trying to do that across an entire stream corridor, it can be really time and, and money intensive. It's also inherently subjective because one person's definition of more dense or less dense can vary uh, from someone else's. And so getting a, a consistent interpretation of Manning's is, is really useful for us as, as hydrologists because we want our models to be accurate, we want them to be consistent, we want them to be repeatable. So through this process of automating the classification of Mannings, we can really start to try to get at that idea of consistency and repeatability. Okay. So this slide shows an example of different types of vegetation classified through our uh, IRIS platform. And we, we came up with this platform uh, to try to meet the, the proposed project requirements from what we were working with with the Mile High Flood District. And effectively, it's a combination of programming logic, if statements, for loops, all that stuff, and then a neural network engine that we're using to make these predictions. So when we fly the drone and over the stream, we can capture a bunch of, of video data, we can process it using Iris, and the resulting shapefile shown here on the on the right is an example of how the the results look when they're processed. Um, once they're processed, we can use these colors because the colors are the same every time coming out of the neural network to say this is where it found grass, this is where it found bushes, this is where it found trees, um, and then ideally use a combination of LIDAR and NDVI to further refine those Manning's classifications based on height and health of the vegetation. And that's part of the IRIS platform of combining all these different data sets that we're able to collect at the same time and then interpreting them using a software so that we're no longer really relying on the subjective interpretation of a person to try to delineate what's going on here. 
So as I mentioned in the previous slide, we've got blue labeled as grass, we've got pink labeled as bushes, and we've got black labeled as trees. And when we stitch all this together, we can do it for n number of miles along a stream channel. We can do it on a greater width so we can encapsulate the entire floodplain. We can automate the flight path of the drone so that there's no longer a person trying to fly this thing around and potentially crash it, which is always a benefit. And um, in this image, there's, oh, sorry, you can go back. In this image, you can see the, the stream channel is currently white and we're using that white category is currently unclassified. So depending on talks, depending on where we want to go with this, we can start classifying other things as well, including impervious surfaces, bike paths, buildings, things of that nature to try to paint a really clear picture of what's in this floodplain, where is it located, and what do we want to do with that? Okay, yeah, you can go on. So another aspect of this project that we wanted to look at was erosion. Um, and you can imagine that finding erosion along an entire stream channel can be fairly difficult, especially if you don't have easy access to the stream channel itself. And so this is another aspect where using drones to survey the area, using artificial intelligence to locate erosion within the collective data, the collected data gives a really quick and clear representation of where that erosion is the extent of that erosion, and by overlaying these shape files through time, we can start to look at how is the erosion changing? Are there places in the stream channel, channel where it's changing more rapidly? Are there places where it's relatively stable, but it looks bad? Um, by automating this, this process of erosion detection, it gives us a timeline where we can go back and we can look at historical erosion from when we started the project, current erosion where we're looking at now, and we can we can really start getting a, a much more comprehensive view of what are these stream channels doing? Are they changing entirely? Are they relatively stable? And, and start addressing those issues as they come up and um, getting a really kind of clear picture on, on where the issues are and where the most need is. So percent composition of trees, bushes, and herbs is luckily one that we can calculate from our Manning shape files. Um, everybody's fairly uh, familiar with you know, area weighted averages. And based on the classification of the stream channel from our, our AI system looking at Manning's values, we can then use an area weighted calculation to quickly get at what is the percent composition like how are there a lot of trees are there a lot of bushes how is the health of this of this ecosystem currently within the metric of percent composition of trees bushes and herbs okay so one of the ones that i mentioned early on in the in the slides was sedimentation and channel obstruction um this is another one where we've we've had preliminary results that indicate that this is going to work similar to erosion but we need stream channels with sufficient data because uh, one, of the, one of the important things about computer vision AI is that it requires enough images to start generalizing to unseen data. Um, and so that requires finding stream channels with sufficient sedimentation or channel obstruction so we can start building these models based on that. Um, and that's just a matter of, of finding them, of being specific with our drone flights and making sure that you know, we can go out there and collect the specific imagery, but it shows similar process, similar promise to erosion. So what comes next in this project? One thing that we want to do is to compare the results of an AI assessment to human observation or what I'm calling here is a traditional stream assessment. I say it's traditional, but we really are just just now developing the stream assessment methodology that you'll hear about in a presentation later from Brian and Tyler, um, maybe later, maybe earlier. I'm not actually sure where we are in the uh, agenda right now, but um, the 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 metrics that we used in this project um, are derived from the stream assessment, the urban stream assessment procedure 
that we're developing at the Mile High Flood District. And obviously those metrics are designed to be assessed by human beings, not by artificial intelligence. Some are designed to be, um, you know, some come from remote sensing data, some come from the ground. There's a long list and we just picked a small list of the of the criteria that we wanted to start testing the AI model with. But we have, you know, um, the ability to go out and collect the same information on the ground the way that we've always done. So that's something that we want to do is to compare the ability of the artificial intelligence model and the drone imagery to collect and assess this information from stream assessments um, to just going out and doing it the way that we've that we've always done. And just because you know those those results don't line up one to one or they might not line up one to one at the first you know result doesn't mean that one or the other is incorrect. It's just a point of data along the process of determining how we kind of correlate and um, you know, relate these two things in such a way that we have results from the AI model that we that we trust and that we're that we're confident in. Um, and you know, we could do things like make sure that there's the same observer um, that's doing you know the observation on the ground versus training the AI model so that we have you know some controlled factors there. But um, that's something that we're going to be doing in in the future. We also want to examine the ability of the model to um, interpret other sources of imagery, and this is something that Respect's already begun doing for us. We have imagery from NearMap, which is a service that provides quarterly high-resolution aerial imagery of the entire flood district. Um, they have their own AI layers that interpret, in this case, vegetation. The height and density of vegetation is going to be expanded over time to other things, um, but we want to compare our results to the AI that NearMap is already doing, as well as to eventually run our um, interpretive model on the NearMap imagery itself and see if that provides us, you know, another source of data. Um, EarthView's imagery is, think of it as Google Street View for streams. Someone straps a 360 camera on their back and actually walks down the middle of the stream channel. Um, this has been done in a number of areas in the flood district. It's essentially a different perspective um, on the stream and you know the imagery just on its own can tell you certain things just looking at it but is there a potential to even apply artificial intelligence to interpreting that imagery from a different perspective that's something we'd like to explore uh, we'd like to look at using it on lidar or photo photogrammetry derived topography from our near map data or from other sources you know there's there's essentially any any source of imagery or any source of photos or video that you can think of is something that could potentially be used to train um, an AI model. It just depends on, you know, we have to do some initial research to determine which ones are useful, which ones are not, which ones are useful for which criteria. Um, it's a, you know, it's kind of a nascent field of research, so it's something that we're trying to to explore and hopefully make useful as soon as, as, soon as possible. Um, something that Andy alluded to is change detection, and that's something that I think is going to be an essential part of the research in this field going forward is, you know, right now we're looking at one point in time and identifying features on a static image. As we collect this data over a period of time, we're able to see has the Thalwig of the stream migrated? Has the bank migrated? Has the bank cut higher than it used to be? Has Are there more obstructions than there used to be? Has Manning in changed? You know, those are the kinds of things that we do in our job on a daily basis is look at the stream, look back at the historic Google imagery, try and see how quickly is this is this stream unraveling or whatever the case might be. Um, and AI and these models are something that can help us automate that process and look at it on a regular basis for the entire district, potentially on you know whatever metric we're interested in, and then alert us to an area that might be changing more quickly or more slowly than the average, which could alert us to potentially something um, something is wrong. So it's another way to uh, to really, like I said before, triage the the stream system over a large area on a on a more frequent basis because we just don't have the time that we would like to go out and you know walk these streams and sit down at our desk and just watch drone flights of 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 um, our channels. You know, it's just not something that's realistic. But we have the we have the data and we have the technology from AI to be able to interpret it and and do some of that initial legwork for us. So why wouldn't we leverage those tools? And another thing that we want to do is obviously explore other techniques and applications for this technology. Like I said, you could really apply this to any kind of imagery in theory that you've collected. It can be applied to other things than imagery as well. And there could be 
really great ideas out there that we just haven't considered because we're right at the beginning of this. So that's something that we hope that you guys can help us brainstorm in the audience or if you have colleagues that are interested in this, the flood district is is actively looking for opportunities to um, to research and explore this technology. So if you have any ideas, let us know. And with that, we will take any questions that you guys have. <laughs>